Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Williams, and joining me is Jim Zobel, MacArthur Memorial Archivist. And we are both historians here at the MacArthur Memorial. And today we're going to be talking about General MacArthur's second award of the Distinguished Service Cross. Now, in the winter of 1918, General John J. Pershing presented then Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur with his second Distinguished Service Cross. And this award was for actions in France at the Cote de Chatillon. Um, and this was between October 14th and 16th, 1918. Now, the citation ends with a very interesting phrase. Um, On a field where courage was the rule, his courage was the dominant feature. So what happened there during those days? And what do we know about the circumstances behind this award? And so that's what we're going to dive into today. Jim, set the stage for us. It's early October 1918. Where is MacArthur? What are his responsibilities? Well, now he's the brigadier uh, commanding the 84th Brigade, which is the 167th Alabama and the 168th Iowa. You know, he'd been chief of staff before that. So his cold duties were kind of facilitating everything the division needed to, you know, move, do operations, things like that. Um, you know, make sure all supplies, logistics, everything. Now he's concentrated just on this brigade because now he's a battlefield commander. Uh, he had been appointed uh, head of the 84th Brigade at the end of that Ork River campaign, the Ein Marne Offensive, and then took them through the Battle of San Miel. And that end of September, all the way through the early part of October, they were right there in the S.A. Pond sector, which is right part of San Miel. And they were kind of doing patrolling and, and digging, digging trenches and just keeping the, the defense of that line. While most of the rest of the army moved to the Meuse Argonne, because that was the next plan that was uh, to take place as uh, the French and the British to the north and the Americans to the south start moving to that northwest or northeast sector of France, you know, right along the border of, of Belgium and the, and the Meuse River. Early October, they get the call to come in because, as you know, they like those first seven divisions that go in and the Meuse are gone, they just get pretty much slaughtered. Um, a lot of green divisions had gone in, a 34th, 35th division had gone in the area where MacArthur's uh, area is going to be. And after that, they had put in the army's, you know, best division of regulars was the first division, which is under Charles Summerall. Summerall had been the artillery brigade commander for the Rainbow Division at the beginning of the war, but then he got transferred into the infantry and he took over the first division. And they as well in this area were what they call the Roman Heights of the Krimheld Stellung German lines, the Hindenburg line. And these heights really control that whole area. And both the 35th and the 1st had gone through in that area to the right of that, the 26th Division, and then the 32nd had gone in. And then on the left, you get the 82nd Division going, and they all get clobbered because um, the Germans hold these heights, and especially this one place, the Cote de Chitillon, which we were talking about today. And it kind of dominates the, the region because to the, to, you know, these hills kind of pop off a flat plain. And so most of the area around the coat uh, to the left of it is kind of a, a flat trajectory of land where the these towns, Landre, Saint-Georges, and Saint-Georges are. And so that's where the, the 83rd Brigade of the Rainbow Division is going to move into. Um, and they get called in to come in early October, and they go and they set up camp around Montfaucon in a... They're there for about a week, just getting rained on and just miserable conditions. And then finally, about the 9th, 10th, they're told you're going to move into this area where the first division has just pulled out of. And so they move to their uh, area called Somerance, Exermont, which are right to the south of this Landre saint George and the Romaine Heights. And so they'll move into this area and they move in the way they always do. The 83rd Brigade is on the left, 84th Brigade is on the right, and you'll have the Ohio, the New York, and then uh, the Alabama and the Iowa groups. And those Ohio and New York guys, they're going to be moving across that flat trajectory, trying to take this area in front of them, these towns, which is all barbed wire, which is all uh, rifle pitch, trenches, everything else. And so 
as they're going to move forward, they're not only going to take everything that's coming in front of them, but the Cote de Chetillon is going to be hammering them from the flank as well. And that's the way it is for the 32nd division, which is to the right of the rainbow, because the Cote dominates this position, the Cote Go to uh, Marie Dame, the, which they're trying to take, Dame Marie. And so it really is the linchpin. And MacArthur figures that out. It, when he gets there on the 11th, he sets up uh, probably about a mile back from that Cote de Chetillon at a place called uh, La Nou Forge, which is like a farm. And he, the 84th Brigade headquarters is there. And Walter Bayer with the 167th Regiment, he's the commander of, of that regiment because the main commander, this guy called Screws, is out because he's sick. You know, at Montfalcon, where they're in that rain, he like got the flu as everybody else does. And so Bear is there at headquarters, uh, which is right next to that La New Forge where MacArthur is, and says they meet up that night and they're just inhaling all sorts of gas, you know, uh, tear gas, uh, you know, epirite gas, everything, and um, just getting obliterated by it. So they finally have to you know, move back from, from where they are because the whole time they're just under fire from the Germans. And MacArthur is the kind of guy, and we know this, he, he goes out on these recons to look at the area where he's gonna have to take. And so on the 12th, uh, he goes out with Walter Wolf and Walter Wolf is his chief of staff of the um, 84th Brigade. And they move forward uh, to look at those hills they're gonna have to go over, as well as to get a view of the Cote de Chetillon. And Wolf says uh, they get hammered with gas that night. MacArthur doesn't wear a gas mask, never does. And Wolf does. And uh, he said that MacArthur inhaled so much gas, he was you know, throwing up completely, didn't, he thought he was done. You know, thought he was not gonna be there for the rest of, of anything that was going on. Now, at the same time, all this is going on, uh, you've got the uh, Alabama groups as well as the Iowa groups. They're doing a uh, recon into this area of the, the Romaine Heights, which is like uh, with the Hill 282, Hill 263, Hill 242, Hill 288, all these hills which are measured by how tall they are. And so they're going to have to move through these. The Germans are all on them. And it comes down to uh, that the, the battle will really start on the 14th. And that's when they start moving. And immediately those guys on the left, uh, they're gonna get stalled out, hammered. They'll bring in tanks to try and help them on the uh, 15th, but that's not gonna work. They all bog down. And it's because they're just getting hammered by what's on top of the, of the coat. And MacArthur realizes this and says, you know, this is the key to everything. We have to put this in. He goes to Summerall, who's the fifth corps commander who they're under, because that's the guy who did have the first division before, but he did such a good job they made him the corps commander. And then he goes to Menaher, who's the head of the 42nd division, says, we need to put an operation to take this, these heights. And, and even Summerall had realized that because um, MacArthur said he came to visit him on the 11th, which was that first night they got there and said, you know, we have to have the coat, you know, and, uh, and that's going to be the main, the main goal of, of, of what this is all about. Now, after those first days, that first day when the Ohio and the New York, and they just get slaughtered there, then Summerall really puts the pressure on, you know, this, this is going to be what we have to take, we have to take it immediately. And that, that day, the 14th, the Iowa group had moved out. They had moved over um, uh, the one of the first main hills and they'd gotten onto that hill 288. And that's the hill that's like almost right in front of where the coat is. The Alabama guys, they were kind of like in this ravine and they moved up right to the, the front of um, the the Bois de Romaine, which is right in front of the Cote de Chetillon. And the Cote de Chetillon is just all barbed wire, pillboxes, everything else. So the Alabama's stuck there for the next two days. I mean, they make it to that second uh, place where it's, and that's, that's where they'll jump off when they make the move. But they are then waiting for the Iowa group to come up um, onto them. Now the 14th, when all those troops get slaughtered uh, on the left, then Summerall's like, we have to have that tonight. And MacArthur orders this bayonet attack you know, for that night. No, no guns to be fired. And everybody in, in the Alabama, as well as the Iowa, knows this is just ridiculous, you know. And um, uh, Cook, who wrote the book about the Rainbow Division, says that MacArthur was thinking maybe back to that Croix Rouge battle, where they had taken it um, just by storming it. But the thing is, is that the Croix Rouge wasn't ringed with the, the type of barbed wire it is. So Walter Bayer, who's that 167th guy, he gets a hold of MacArthur and says, you know, this isn't going to work. We can't do that. And so they rescind that order. 
the next day, the 15th, the, the, the troops in the New York and Ohio are pretty much bogged down. That Alabama group is bogged down. But Lloyd Ross, who's the commander of the 1st Battalion of that Iowa group, uh, the regiment, uh, he's really, you know, the guy who's the linchpin of, of everything. And they move over those hills and get right to almost where they're at the jump off point to go up to the coat, which is they call the, the Tuileries Farm and the Musard Farm are right there in front of, of the Cote de Chatillon. <clears throat> MacArthur is with those groups, the Iowa group, the whole time as they're moving forward. Um, and, and that's what his citation comes is from those days of the 14th to the 16th. So he's, we know that um, because of Fraser Hunt's book and Fraser Hunt was a journalist there at that time and he's with the rainbow. And he you know, knows that he's there one day when MacArthur comes back through those drives over the hills and he got right into the mix of a, a fight between a, you know, a, a platoon of 168 soldiers and, and a, a German machine gun nest that was there on Hill 288 and you know, caught some bullets through, the, through the, um, the, his clothes. And so he's, he's up there in it. You know, I mean, he's a brigadier general. He's not right in there with the platoons, you know, fighting up and in, into all these things, but he's behind reforming the lines, you know, working with everybody, making sure that supplies, keeping the stragglers, you know, from, from, from pushing back. And so he's very much part of this drive and he's very much, you know, a part of being into it. But, you know, as, as far as being like in, you know, exact combat, you know, with the troops right up front, no, but that's not where he's supposed to be, you know? And a lot of people have made a lot of things like, well, he wasn't really, well, yeah, you know, but shut up, you know, I mean, that's, that's his job, you know, he's doing what his job is. And he never said that, you know, I mean, if, even if you look at reminiscences or anywhere else, he never said that I was in the direct you know, middle of the combat, you know, it was like, it was like, you know, the, the groups did this, they all did this, you know, this was all their battle, you know, and, and that's, you know, people talk about, you know, MacArthur being, oh, it's, you know, where's my medal and everything, but, you know, really when asked about things in the, in, you know, as things would come on, he would give the credit to a lot of other people. So the 14th through the 16th, you know, they're driving, he's with them the whole time, you know, kind of controlling things, making sure they have everything they need. And then they get to the 16th. And on the, the night of the 15th, uh, Walter Bear was ordered back to MacArthur's headquarters. And, and Bear is this Alabama guy. And he comes back to MacArthur's headquarters and Cooper wins there. He's with the 151st Machine Gun uh, Battalion, as well as uh, the Lloyd Ross of that 168th um, Battalion, Matthew Tinley, who's one of the 168th as well. And they all get together about what they're going to do. And Bear had met with this, the head of the 3rd Battalion of the Alabama, Ravi Norris, right before that. And Bear was like, you know, we're going to you know, make this move tomorrow morning, you know, and we'll go through this. Uh, we're going to make the drive up. And, and Fowler was like, OK, well, is anybody going to ask me what I want to do? And Fowler had found this cut where he could get down in front of uh, the position he was in and not be... Uh, hit by the Germans in front of him and he could make a move into the uh, 168 sector and then maybe come around, you know, around the coat. And that's what he tells Bear he wants to do. So Bear goes to this meeting uh, on the night of the 15th before the big attack and uh, MacArthur's sitting there and says, Summerall is going to give us a call. And Summerall calls and says, you've got to take the coat tomorrow by 6 you know, p.m. MacArthur says, all right, if we don't, you'll have a list of 5,000 casualties. I'll be at the head of it. Uh, Bear you know, goes to MacArthur, says, look, I've got this plan. He doesn't tell him it's Robbie Norris's, you know, decision to go to the right and whatnot. But they had found out that there was a cut in the wire that the Germans use to come and maintain the wire. And MacArthur goes, yep, that's there, because then he produces these photographs, aerial photographs, you know, first type of aerial reconnaissance really going on that they've taken of the coat, which shows where this break is. Those are all up at the University of Michigan with William Hughes's papers. Hughes was the chief of staff at this point. And so it's kind of like this conglomeration of everybody's ideas that come together to put this thing together. So the next morning, the, the 167th, 3rd Battalion makes that drive into the 168th sector. They get through the wire. Um, and they get around the side of the coat. And the same, that same morning, Ross takes his guys, they totally capture Hill 288, they totally capture the Tuileries farm there, and then they make a move around to the, the backside because they realize in those photographs that the barbed wire kind of petered out around to the backside of it. MacArthur is there at the wire, you know, when they go in. We know that because um, stories that came out in 19. 42 that Pershing told George Duncan, who was the head of the 82nd Brigade, 
about MacArthur going up to the commander that was going in and said, this is all on you. You know, everything that's going to happen right now is because of you. You've got to do this. You know, I can see that you're going to do it. You're, you've earned the DSE. And, and suppose MacArthur gave him his own DSC, you know, at that point, this, you know, this leadership thing, you know, I can see that you're going to do this. And we wait, did wait, find MacArthur, a letter from- Hang on, Jim, MacArthur yeah. gave him his- his. The DSC MacArthur had been awarded right. several and months been, earlier. Been awarded before, action. right? And that's the story, you know. And for the longest time, you know, I just I thought, okay, yeah, it's a story. But then I found a letter that was written to MacArthur by Robbie Norris in 1942, and um, Robbie Norris writes right on there: "It was to me that you gave the DSC at the Cove," you know, and you know, so to me that shows that you know, it did happen, you know, and MacArthur was there at the wire. You now, mentioned, um, you mentioned Frazier Hunt and, and that letter. What other sources do we have about MacArthur? Well, uh, Lloyd Ross, who's that, that head of that 168, he wrote a memoir about it um, as well. Bayer wrote about it. He wrote about those meetings, you know, with MacArthur and the gas. Walter Wolf, he writes about the gas attack MacArthur gets on the 12th. Um, as well, you've got Robbie Norris wrote an account of what happened. Um, and then, uh, and like I said, MacArthur's, you know, in his remnant, it's a very small part. You right. know, he write, and he, he pretty much, you know, gives the, the, you know, this is the plan we came up with, and this is what they did. Um, Robbie Norris, uh, that morning, he is going to control it from the back, kind of like MacArthur controls the whole um, brigade from the back, Robin or Norris will control that, that regiment, the third battalion that goes in there, that battalion, and he gives his captain, Thomas Fala, the, the control of this group. Fala gets them through the wire, they get up to the left of the side. This is almost the same time that uh, Lloyd Ross's group has gotten his first battalion around the other side of the hill. They're not in contact, but then um, word comes through, uh, uh, Fala through Robbie Norris gets to MacArthur, who is on, I think, we believe, on Hill 263, because you can see everything on the coat going on at that point. And there's a liaison with the 167th that been there ever since they got to France, named Maurice Johan. And he's this guy who's going to be a great friend of MacArthur's for the rest of his life. Uh, he'll, he runs this big uh, champagne winery, uh, but you know he's a, a colonel in the French army. And when the word comes through that that Norris or that Fala and Norris are ready to go on this one side, they need a signal. Juhin runs around the position around Tuileries Farm and runs to get a hold of uh, uh, Ross to tell him, you know, what the plan is. And so that's how it all comes together. And then uh, they they make this, they blow the whistle three times. And right before the attack was going off, uh, Lieutenant Colonel came to control the backside where Robbie Norris was. And uh, he, you know, which keeping the stragglers, everybody in line, you know, keeping everything going. And so Norris goes to join Fala. He gets shot, you know, as soon as he comes through the, the wire and then they make a joint attack on the top. And uh, this is about four o'clock, you know, 2.30 in the afternoon. And by four o'clock, they've they've got the heights and, and that's it. I mean, um, the, once they've got that, the, the Hindenburg lines kind of open, the, the British have broken through at the same time up North as well as the, the French have broken through. And so within a couple of weeks, you're going to, you're going to have the end come, you know, cause this is a uh, October 16th now. And, and by the 11th, it's going to be over, you know, uh, the, the second division will come in right after this and they'll, they'll move right through the, the 42nd division. So they, you know, they did it once again. MacArthur is, is put up for the, um, I think that he gets the DSC, but then they review it for the Medal of Honor because uh, Summerall and Menaher both wanted to give him the Medal of Honor for this. But it comes down to that review board, you know, that'll. that'll so that. I've, um... We tend to get questions from people wanting to know why he does not receive a Medal of Honor in World War One. Yeah. Um, you know, he received his 
first DSC several months before the one we're talking about today. Um, a few months after this award, he gets a Distinguished Service Medal, um, seven citation stars that are now silver stars, um, but no Medal of Honor. Um, and as you said, I think Summerall does kind of put him forward for a Medal of Honor. But we've I've also heard a lot of um, I don't know if they're not rumors, but people have speculated that his Distinguished Service Cross from this action on this day is a downgrade of the Medal of Honor um, because Pershing doesn't see it as something that he wants to give general officers. Is that is there evidence of that? Is that what the second Distinguished Service Cross is? Just a well, downgrade? I've heard, I've heard that about you know Pershing and, and not wanting to give the the Medal of Honor to General Office, but I don't, you know, I, I, is there, yeah, you know, I've never seen ever make a statement of that, or anything yeah. like that. But the, the thing is, is, is like I said, I, I, th I think he was awarded the DSC and then it's reviewed for Medal of Honor because, you know, uh, both Summerall and Menaher, you know, are like, you should get the Medal because they do do a review, you know, they come down to review uh, who, sh if he should get the Medal of Honor. And the thing is, is they, they do a review and they go to the rainbow division and they're like, okay, we've done a review of these people, you know, and, um, but MacArthur's, you know, doesn't meet the criteria. Who do you think should get the medal of honor? And, and Hughes is like, every single person in this division thinks that MacArthur should get the medal of honor. You know, I've got a thousand, I've got a thousand affidavits of everybody who's seen him since day one, you know, be mm -hmm. up there you know, at everything. And, you know, people talk about him being a talker, but like we've talked before, he doesn't talk about World War One very much. You know, right. I mean, uh, he doesn't, you know, write about everything that happens. And I think that's, you know, and, and we see that a lot with, you know, a lot of these people that are in direct combat, they don't talk about it. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's something that gets suppressed in, inside. They'll talk about other people, you know, about what who they were there with, right? You know, and they might they might talk to to some people, but um, a lot you know a lot of it is that way, and and that's what I mean, you know. Um, and we've said that before, like Garo, the fourth army commander, who says that MacArthur is the greatest officer, the most bravest, most you know. Um, he's been in every action, you know, that I've, I've never met an officer like him, you know, and this is a guy who's got a, you know, a Garo that is, who's got a, you know, a fantasy career that's just unbelievable. He's met right. people, you know, just from all walks of life. And, and he says, MacArthur, but we're like, what did he see? You know, because MacArthur doesn't go through, you know, point by point, this is what happened. This is what happened. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, and there was that book that was written by that guy, Robert Farrell, you know, where he says that, you know, MacArthur wasn't there and, and everybody else lied and only I know the truth, you know, which was just garbage, um, you know, and MacArthur didn't lie about anything because he did have the frontline experience. Everybody knew it. Everybody said so, you know, Weller and White, they both write the affidavits. They were with MacArthur the whole time you know, they're on, on, on the coat. They say, you know, they don't say he's right in the middle of the top of the coat, you know, in the middle of the fight, but they say he's the one that, you know, manipulates everybody that gets everything, you know, uh, still going, keeping it going, you know, and, and uh, that's, that's what they were putting him up for, you know, so is it a downgrade, you know, Pershing, he approves that major generalship because the next day they, they want to promote him to major general, um, right. And Pershing approves that, but it's really the War Department that says no to that, you know. Well, and the end of the war, too. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like and it was because of the end of the war. So to say that Pershing had a, a mark against MacArthur, well, we know he he thinks MacArthur is a, you know, a blowhard at times, but so was Pershing, you know. Yeah. He just doesn't like somebody grabbing the spotlight out of his spotlight, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, and I mean... You were, you were talking about what a lot of what we know about MacArthur's actions, because he doesn't tell us himself come from other sources, yeah. what they saw, what they remembered. And I mean, obviously, Pershing was hearing substantial things about MacArthur's leadership on the battlefield, because in his efficiency report, you know, he basically says this is our greatest battlefield yeah. commander in this war. So, I mean, that 
you know, he qualifies that obviously with MacArthur having a high estimate of his <laughs> own abilities. But I mean, that's, I think that's high praise from someone like Pershing. And he's not just going to say that if he doesn't have, you know, um, yeah. firsthand knowledge, or at least he's not hearing these things about and what- And Menaher and, and Summerall as well. I mean, Summerall, you know, he's a guy who's there at the Boxer Rebellion. You know, he's a guy mm-hmm. who's you know, been in the Spanish-American War. He's seen people- you know, he knows how to judge people. So does Menaher. Menaher's a, you know, a classmate of Pershing's. He's a great friend of Pershing's. Um, but, the, you know, these guys, uh, they they look at MacArthur as, as being very, very special. Right. You know? And so does everybody in the rainbow. I mean, those mm-hmm. those guys will go to go to their grave thinking he was the king. You know, and I mean, the, the main thing is, is you know, I'd, I'd like to see Lloyd Ross's diary. Supposedly, this guy Farrell had, you know, uh, 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 the only access to it. And the family still has it. You know, at least that's what he said. You know, because I was like, where is this thing? Well, I can't tell you that. You know, so it was just kind of like, OK. Um, MacArthur does mention um, later on the heroism of those around him. Do you want to touch on any of those stories? Well, the 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 big one is Ross. Okay. Um, in in forty nine, it was uh, it was um, Lloyd Ross's birthday in the the Rainbow, and I think the American Legion was having this big birthday party for him in Red Oak, Iowa. And MacArthur gets a, a telegram in Iowa, in Japan, you know where he is, and they're saying we're having this party for Ross. You know, could you send us some words? And MacArthur said, the glory of the rainbow rests on the shoulders of Lloyd Ross. Mm. You know, he's, he's the guy. And that, that kind of says it, you know, and that's the way he would be with, you know, all these other people, you know, about that were in the rainbow. Um, Dwayne Dietrich, he's the guy that donated that stuff up to Michigan, but he was on our board. And he knew MacArthur as a kid, you know, and he would go, he would hear MacArthur's going to be at this place. He would go there and MacArthur would talk to him because this, you know, Dietrich was this smart guy. And uh, even as a kid, and he said that they were at a place, it was during a, a Chicago thing and MacArthur was there talking with people and somebody all of a sudden came up and had a rainbow pin on and said MacArthur was immediately just grabbed him by the shoulders, you know, it was just, yeah. you know, my boy, my boy, you know, just, that's the way he looked at it, you know, and it was the closest thing to his, to his heart, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Any final thoughts? No, I think we had, you know, had talked before about, you know, did, when does he really deserve it? You know, does the Medal he, of Honor. Yeah, you know, and would I've this always, have been a more legitimate award than 1942? Than 42. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and I think MacArthur recognized that what 42 was, was, you know, basically for everybody in a propaganda, you know, ploy or, you know, tool. But I think that, you know, Veracruz probably, you know, he probably deserved it more than anything because that was just out of control, you know. And, uh, but this one, this one, I don't know, you know, um, I think. I think scholars would probably have a, a, maybe a slightly different opinion of him if he was a Medal of Honor recipient from the First World War as opposed to the Second World yeah. War, so. Well, Don, you know, while Bill Donovan gets it there at the at the battle there at, at Landre Saint-Georges, so. Mm-hmm. And he was a colonel, you know, so it's not a general officer, but, you know, they, they did meet him out, you know, for that, for that battle. And uh, Thomas Niebuhr, he gets one for, you know, his work at the top of the code. He was a private in the, the Alabama. So there are the Medal of Honor winners. It's just mm-hmm. not one of them at that time. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Jim. Thank you.